All right, so in John chapter 14, it's, um, if you notice, I don't know if, if you have a red letter Bible or not, the red letter Bible is the, the words of Jesus Christ in red. And um, if you do have one of those, you'll notice that, and it's just like any chapter of the Bible, really. Chapter 14 is just simply a continuation of chapter 13. Oftentimes the chapters are broken up into different events and it's kind of, you know, it ends at one place and starts up in another. But um, originally when the, when the Bible was penned down, it wasn't broken up into chapters. Now, there, there were paragraphs and other things to denote kind of a break, but um, not necessarily chapters. So it's important to know. We'll just look back real quick. Um, because what he's, he's saying here in, in verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. This is a continuation from chapter 13, where he just had told Peter that he was going to deny him three times. If you remember, we went into that last week. He says, before, um, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Now, just because there's a chapter break here doesn't mean that it's uh, necessarily much of a break in the conversation, if any at all. Because Jesus is, was speaking then, and he's still speaking now in chapter 14. So even though he says, you know, you're going to deny me three times, the next thing he says is, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. So he's, he's trying to still comfort them. He says, look, this is what's going to happen. And he knows that everyone's going to be scattered from him. He knows that they're going to deny him and he's going to be left alone. But he's still trying to give them some comfort. And there's a lot of comfort in this chapter. There's, we, we get a lot of insight into the Holy Ghost being the comforter and how he's going to send them comfort. We're going to get into that a little bit later. But he starts off even in verse number one saying, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. He says, I know you believe in God, believe in me also. He says in verse two, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. So, and this is pretty exciting for us too as believers. Jesus is going, he's telling them, look, I'm going to go and I'm going to make a place for you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. My, in my father's house, there are many mansions and I'm going to go prepare a special place for you. And this is something that, that, you know, we hear a lot of negative preaching and a lot of areas of our life, you know, we're sinners, we need to work on things, but don't ever let yourself get down. And, and get to a point to where you just feel extremely discouraged because we have a lot to look forward to. Now, a lot of the preaching is done to motivate you and to get you moving and, and to understand the seriousness and the consequences of our sins and, and to try to get you to ch make some kind of a change in your life. And that's all very important. But while we're focusing on those things, we can't lose sight of the prize. We can't lose sight of the wonderful, amazing things that God has for us. He's talking about many mansions in his father's house and Jesus Christ himself preparing a place for us. He says, I'm going to go. I'm going to depart from you. And that might be sad. I'm going to leave you. But what I'm doing, I'm going to prepare a place for you in heaven. That's what I'm doing. So keep that in mind when you're discouraged, when you're sad, when you're down, when you're sad because Jesus is gone specifically to his disciples. You know, when you have these things, don't let your heart be troubled. Because I'm doing something. I'm doing something for you because I love you. That's what he's telling them. Verse number three says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. A reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Him promising, saying, you know what? If I go, which he did, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back. I'm not just going to leave you. I'm not going to go and prepare a place and then just leave you high and dry and be like, okay, see, I got a place over here. No, he's like, I'm going to come back. And he says that where I am, there you, you know, ye may be also. There ye may be also. And um, the day of Christ is going to be a great day for those of us who are saved. Now, you hear in the Bible, there's, there's, there's and I'm not going to get into it too much tonight. I'll preach a whole sermon on this, about the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. And those are two separate events, you can say, but I believe that they both take place on the same day. And we'll get into that. I, I don't have it all marked down. We got a lot more stuff to get into tonight. But the day of Christ, just real briefly, is always a positive reference and it's a positive mention. And you can see why here. Because the, the, the day of Christ is always 
in regards to believers. So when Jesus Christ comes back, that is a good day for us. And it makes sense if you think about it, right? When Jesus Christ comes back in the clouds, if we are alive at that time, yes, is there going to be great tribula tribulation? Of course. There's going to be troubles. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be some really hard times. But think about how great that moment will be when Jesus Christ actually returns and you see him in the clouds of heaven and he comes back, your Savior coming to save you out of all of those troubles. You know, the, 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 the minor salvations that we receive in our life when we're going through hard times, the harder the time is that you're going through, the more you really appreciate the, the relief from that hardship, whatever it may be. You think about like um, even something as simple as maybe just running a race and you're in like a really long race. Man, that finish line is, is much more glorious to get to than it is when you just do a sprint. When you're doing a sprint and the finish line's right, you know, 100 yards in front of you, making it to that finish line isn't a relief like, oh man, finally, you know what, that huge task is over because it was a short, it was just a short endurance that you're doing. But when you're doing, you know, marathons and, and these super long runs, man, that relief that you get to at the end, it's like, oh, you exerted so much energy into it and it could be anything in your life. I mean, you're going through major struggles or, or trials or, or, you know, problems in your life. The harder it is, the more relief and, and, the, and the better you feel when it's all over, when there's that point where it's just like, okay, that's all done. And that's the way it's going to be when Jesus Christ comes back. We're going to be going through great tribulation. It's going to be serious hard times. There are going to be people out to kill you and you're not going to be able to buy or sell. You're probably going to be hungry. There's going to be all these different things going on that are going to be troubling you. But when we see that glorious return of Jesus Christ in the clouds, it's going to be amazing. I mean, for one, we're going to see the Lord in the air if we're still alive and remain unto that day. If we're here, we're going to see Jesus Christ, which is amazing. I mean, none of us have seen him physically with our own eyes to that point. So that's going to be, that is going to be great in and of itself. And he's also going to be coming. We're going to know he's coming to save us. So that is a day of, of great rejoicing for the saved. But for the unsaved, it's not a day of rejoicing. For those that are going after God's people who are putting his, his saints to death, when Jesus Christ comes back, that's going to be a very scary day for them because they're going to be seeing, you know, the Jesus Christ, the one that they were, that they've been, um, you know, killing all of his disciples and all, and all of his followers they're going to realize, oh, maybe we shouldn't have been doing all this when Jesus Christ comes back. If they realize that, I don't know, or they'll just have hatred for him, but there's going to be a lot. It's, it's not going to be a fun day for those. And that's where the day of the Lord really starts going into God's wrath and pouring out judgment and justice upon the earth um, for all the wickedness. And the day of the Christ is, is a happy event. But we'll, I'll, I'll, probably, I'll preach a whole sermon about that coming up soon. But... Um, this is great here in, in verse number three, because he says, um, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. That's just one of his promises and receive you unto myself that where I am there, you may be also something we have to look forward to the return of Jesus Christ to go and just be with him for eternity. It's going to be a, a great glorious day. Let's keep reading here. Verse four says, and whither I go, ye know, and the way, ye know, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Very profound statement here. It's a very famous statement in the Bible. And we use this oftentimes out soul winning because it's, it's, so, it's so profound. It's so unequivocal. Jesus Christ just makes a bold statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me he says, there is no possible way for a person to get unto, unto the Father except through Jesus Christ. As we saw with, um, with him referring to himself as a good shepherd, and he is the door, and, and anyone who tries to get in any other way is a thief and a robber, you can only get into that pastor through, through Jesus Christ. He's that door. You can only get to the Father through him. And you know, a lot of people will say, Oh, you know, Judaism of today, they worship the same God. They just don't 
accept Jesus. But they still believe the Old Testament. They still, you know, it's still the Lord. It's still Jehovah. It's still the same God. No, it's not. And if you think that, I don't care what you think, if you think that a Jew is going to go to heaven just because they were born of the, seed, the physical seed of Abraham, or if they get some kind of special ticket, Jesus Christ says contrary in this verse right here. He says, I am the way, the truth, and life. If you're not going through Jesus Christ, if your faith is not on the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no way to the Father. You cannot get to God the Father unless it's through Jesus Christ. He says, I am the only way. And you know what? Christianity is the only religion that states that, that makes this type of a claim. You can talk to people of all other religions of the world, and it's, it's interesting because... Every other religion other than biblical Christianity is a works-based religion. Every single one. Every single one relies on how good of a person you are in one degree or another. And all of them, none of them will condemn you know, other people. It's always possible through the law. So like you could have you know, uh, a Buddhist or a um, Hindu not care that you're a Christian because according to their set of rules and their beliefs, well, if you're believing the Bible, that's just fine because you'll end up okay too. You'll end up in heaven or in a good place or whatever they believe is the good outcome of this life. Um, even Muslims, I mean, if they'll, they'll, they'll claim to believe in, in lots of the Bible and even though you don't believe in Muhammad, a lot of them will think, and I know there's different variations of this, but, but a lot of them will say, well, you know, if you're doing good and if you're doing right, your good will, will outweigh your bad and you'll be okay too. And there's so many different religions of the world that teach the same exact thing, but not Christianity. Not the Bible. Jesus Christ said, you know what? I am the only way. And if you're not going through Jesus Christ, specifically, if your faith is not in Him alone, you will not get to the Father. You will not get to heaven. You will actually be burning in hell forever and ever and ever. And I don't care how good of a person you are. That is what the Bible teaches. And that's what's so exclusive about Christianity is that you know everyone else might say, oh, well, they're okay with us. But we're not okay with what they believe. Because what they believe is going to send them to hell. But they, no one else, no other religion has this type of a belief. It's exclusive. And Jesus Christ made no bones about it. He, he is very clear about the doctrine here, about being the way, the truth. He didn't say, I am a way. Well, I'm, I'm a way to the Father. You know, you've got your way, and I've got my way, and my way is through Jesus, your way is through... No, that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what Jesus Christ taught. He said he's the only way. And you got these false televangelist prophets, these false teachers like Billy Graham that go on air and will say that, oh, they've got the light that they're going to follow and these other people have a light that they're going to follow, but we're all worshiping the same God. We're all going to end up in the same place. It's heresies and lies. Because if they're not going through Jesus Christ, they're not going to the Father, period. That's what Jesus says. Now, this is a very profound statement in many ways. I want to I break this apart because he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we're going to see other scriptures talking about the way, the truth, and the life and how they apply to Jesus Christ because He is the only way. The way. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 7. Keep your finger in John. We're going to go to Matthew 7. Because what does He mean? I am the way. Well, all this is regard to salvation because He says, He follows everything up with, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So He is the way. He's not a way, he's not a path. It is one, there's one way to get to heaven. There's one way, and it's through Jesus Christ. Matthew 7, look at verse number 13. The Bible says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. That word straight there doesn't mean it's not crooked, it means it's narrow. The gate is narrow. He says, For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. This is talking about you know, the way to heaven. The way to life is straight. It's narrow. The reason why it's narrow is because it's only through Jesus Christ. That is the only way to get there. But the way to destruction is broad. It's real wide. Hey, there's all kinds of different paths and different ways you can take to get to hell, to get to destruction. Choose your way. It's basically any other way except for the one right way. 
which is through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is, is the way. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 8. We're going to see um, references to the truth. Now, also in John chapter 14, what we're going to be covering, as is in, you know, I, I feel like a broken record sometimes going through the book of John because there's so much um, content on the deity of Christ and on the Trinity doctrine. The fact that Jesus Christ and God the Father and the Holy Spirit are one. And in this chapter, we're going to see a little bit more with the Holy Spirit and with God the Father, but, but up to this point, it's been mostly, you know, I and my Father are one, and, and a lot of references to Jesus Christ being God in the flesh, but um, we're going to introduce the Holy Spirit. But we're going to see here a little bit, as we're digging into his statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life, we're going to see how the truth and the life are applied to not just Jesus. So if Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and then we see that the truth and the life are applied to God the Father and applied to um, the Holy Spirit, it proves that, that doctrine of the three in one. Um, let's look at you in John chapter 8, look at verse 31. The Bible says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And again, Jesus Christ is the truth. So if we want to know the truth, we have to literally know Jesus Christ. And all this stuff just blows my mind how, how, how it all fits together with Jesus Christ being the Word. The Word is the truth. Jesus Christ is the truth. We have to know Jesus. We have to know the Word in order to be made free. Um, it's amazing. Turn, if you would, to John 17. You're in John 8. Just flip over to John 17. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. This was a statement just in context. Jesus is praying to God. If you jump up to, to the beginning of John 17, it's Jesus in a prayer to the Father. And, and that whole chapter is, is basically him praying. And in, in verse 17, he's saying, Sanctify them, talking about other people, through thy truth. Sanctifying is setting someone apart. It'd be saving them, right? Sanctifying them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. God's word is truth. Jesus is God's word because Jesus said that he is the truth. 2 Thessalonians 2.12, you don't have to turn there. Turn if you would to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. 2 Thessalonians 2.12 says, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So again, you need to believe the truth. You need to believe on Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Jesus Christ is the truth. 1 John chapter 5, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Now look at that. We saw that God's Word is truth. Jesus Christ says, I am the truth. And here it's saying that the Spirit is truth. And then, of course, the very famous next verse, verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Ties in perfectly. That, that just proves that three in one, that Trinity doctrine that we, that we hold to. And... It's easy to see why people say that God the Father and God the Son and the Holy Spirit are all separate. Because you look at things pretty obvious, like, well, if Jesus is praying to the Father, you know, they're obviously distinct. They're separate. And I'm pointing this out because it is important that, that, we, um, that we understand exactly what we believe. Because we believe that they are distinct and separate. Yet, while they are distinct and separate, they are still one at the same time. Because the Bible is very clear on, on distinctions between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But we have verses like this and like these other ones that prove that they, yet, even though they are separate, they are still one. And people have kind of a hard time getting their heads around that. But um, the Bible is very clear. It's not, it's not making a... Um, a statement that, that's hard to interpret. 
It's simply stating these three are one. And in English, you, you might say that's just doesn't make any sense because how can three equal one? If you're thinking about it in math terms, you, you, know, you can't have a three on this side, a one on this side, and it equals in the middle. That doesn't make any sense. Yet, this truth is greater than just that simple math equation. It's a, it's a, it's a much more dimensional um, concept of God to be able to grasp how those three can all be one. Um, but it's proven over and over again in Scripture. And it's not even just this one verse that we have, as, you, as you've seen already. You know, it's statements that Jesus Christ has made himself, claiming to be one with the Father, claiming, um, you know, saying that he is the truth. And in other portions of Scripture, of God's Word, it's saying that, you know, God's Word is truth and that the Spirit is truth. The Holy Spirit is truth. Now let's focus on the life. Turn, if you would, back to John chapter 5. John chapter 5 and verse 26. Because Jesus Christ also said he is the life. John 5, 26 says, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. John 6, flip over John 6, verse 63. The Bible says, It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So again, we see here now, the words are life. The word, thy word is truth. God's word is truth. We saw that before. And now we see that the words, they are spirit and they are life. Just as much as Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ is the word, which, which makes them all equal. The word is truth. The word is life. Flip, if you would, to John 11. We're doing some highlights. I know we've gone through these in the past. They're familiar verses, but um, they haven't been applied in this way, just focusing in on the life and Jesus being the life. John 11:25. 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Why is he going to live? Because Jesus is the life. Jesus provides the life for us. When we get saved and the Holy Spirit comes into our, in, into our hearts, we, that is life in us. Um, turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter number 5. Romans chapter 5, verse number 10. The Bible says, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by His life. And that's referring to the life that Jesus led. But we are saved by the life of Jesus Christ, the life that He led, what, what He did for us and all the amazing miracles and righteousness that He had. His righteousness is imputed unto us. We're saved by His life, not just by His death. Um, flip, if you would, to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, just a few pages over. Romans 8, verse 9, the Bible says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. So here we're seeing that the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Again, Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Here the Bible is saying the Spirit is life, and that Spirit dwells inside of us once we believe on him. And he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit. So our, our, our bodies that are dead, our mortal bodies that are, that are sinful in the flesh, are going to be made alive by the Spirit that dwells in us. That's what's going to give us our new body. That's what's going to change us and make us new, um, give us our new bodies. Colossians 3, you don't have to turn there. Turn if you would to first, back over to 1 John chapter number 1. Colossians 3, 4 says, 
When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Again, another reference to Jesus being our life and his second coming, that we're going to appear with him in glory. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 1, the Bible says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. This is referring to Jesus Christ actually as eternal life, as life. Jesus was life incarnate. He was life in the flesh. Just, we've, we've seen um, you know, 1 Timothy 3.16, greatest mystery of godliness, that God was manifest in the flesh. Well, here, life was manifest unto us in the form of Jesus Christ. Um, it's, it's amazing how well the Bible fits together. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Go back, if you would, to John 14. Acts 4, 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Again, going back to the exclusivity of Christianity and getting salvation through Jesus Christ, how he is the only way. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And um, that is, is confirmed in multiple places as well. Jesus Christ is necessary for salvation, and He is the only way for salvation. Great, uh, great verse. I encourage you to use that. There's a lot of people who we talk to out soul, and they'll like to say, oh, well, that's just what you believe and what you follow. And what about these people who grow up in Saudi Arabia? You know, and they'll, just, they'll, say, they'll kind of say, like, well, what about them? You know, you're just, people will call you know, Christianity the white man's religion or something stupid like that, even though it originated way back, uh, like a super long time ago, um, not in Europe, right, but in the Middle East. So, um, people like to say that, oh, this is just your religion, the white man religion, and what about everyone else? Well, they don't have the truth. Jesus Christ is the truth, and you have to believe the truth to be saved. They're believing a lie. Anything that is not of Christ, anything, any belief that doesn't have to do with Christ and is not through Christ is a lie, because Jesus Christ is the truth. And this is a great verse to use to say, well, you know, this is why people who believe in other religions aren't, aren't saved and they're not going to go to heaven. It's because Jesus Christ is the, the only way. And that's what the Bible says. And some people will even, I've heard people who are claimed to be Christians and believe the Bible that like to hold to this, to this belief that other people will still go to heaven because they just can't fathom the thought of people going to hell. So they just want to think that, oh, well, well as long as they're good people, they're going to heaven. No. And the Bible you claim to believe actually says contrary to that. But let's keep reading here. I'm going to get off that point. Look at, look at verse number 8. Jesus says, If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Again, the, the deity of Christ, basically if he's saying here, you know the Father and have seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's a pretty bold statement to make. You can't make that unless you truly are God in the flesh, as Jesus Christ was. Verse number 8, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us, us. Sufficeth us, sorry. And so Philip's like, wait, what do you mean we know the Father and we've seen him? You know, show us the Father. It's that, that's good enough for us. Just show us the Father. So uh, Jesus answers him, verse 9, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? So he's, he's Jesus saying, wait, you've been with me for this long and you still don't get it? He's like, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. I don't have to show you the Father because you've already seen the Father. When you've, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And that's, um, that's pretty amazing to, to be able to make that type of statement. Let's keep reading here, verse number 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? So again, he kind of jumps back and forth between the oneness of, of him with the Father and the Spirit and the separation between him and the Father and the Spirit. 
And um, because he just said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But now he's saying that he is in the Father and the Father is in him. Um, showing that there still is a distinction. Verse 10, we'll keep reading there. He says, um, The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. They didn't come from him. He says, But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Again, a really neat statement he's making here. He's saying that anyone that believes on him, he says, the works that I do, you're going to do them also and greater works. Now that word greater, it doesn't mean that he's going to do like more amazing works. You know, those that follow him, it's not like it's going to be, you know, Jesus raised the dead. Well, if they're going to do greater works than that, what could it possibly be? It doesn't mean that. That word greater just means like more in abundance. Um, and the reason why that is, is, is he clearly says, because I go unto my Father. The reason why they're going to do more works than he did is because he's leaving. Because his ministry was three and a half years. Because that's it. He's, he's, he's leaving and, and his time is cut short. Otherwise, there's no way anyone would be able to do that. But he's saying, look, if you believe on me, you're going to do great works. And didn't the apostles do like the same works that Jesus did? They healed people. They did, you know, all kinds of miracles. And it was obviously through the power of God. But they were going to do great, like more works in number than Jesus Christ did because they had more time to fulfill that. But um, that power that he had, that he shares with the believers to, to be able to do these amazing things, and it's all the power of God. Um, it's amazing that, that people and believers can actually accomplish and do these great works because the Father is using them to do those things. Verse 13 says, And whosoever ye shall ask, and, uh, sorry, excuse me, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. This is a very uplifting chapter. And it's funny because, I mean, he's, he's doing this on purpose. This is right before he's going to be put to death. This is right before his execution. So he's telling his disciples all of these things. You know, don't let your heart be troubled. I'm with you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I am the way, the truth, the life. Look, you've seen the Father. You've seen me. You know, and not only that, he says, anything you ask in my name, I'll do it. Anything you ask. This is one of the reasons why. This is why we pray and you typically hear um, now it's just kind of habit for most people we pray we say in Jesus name amen right and the reason why we say that is because of this verse because he says if you ask anything in my name so when we make our prayers to God typically at the end we're, we're, we're telling God God all these things that we're asking you for we're praying these in the name of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ promise us and said that if we ask anything in his name, he'll do it. Amen. And this is the promise from Jesus. Do you, do you trust Jesus Christ with your soul to take you to heaven when you die? If you do, we can trust these words that he said to us. This is why we have our prayer requests in the bulletin. This is why I'm, I'm trying to emphasize prayer so much because prayer truly is powerful. It may sound like a cliche, but it's true. People say that you hear it all the time and often I think we hear it so much that you brush it aside and you don't really think about it. But Jesus Christ said, look, if you ask in my name, I'll do it. That's a promise. And, and we need to keep that in remembrance and don't get slack in our prayer life thinking that, oh, it's not that big of a deal because you think like you don't see any results. God will give you the results. He promises to do those things. Now, obviously, there's, there's a few more things involved with prayer in general, living a good, you know, kind of being a good child of God so that God's going to be wanting to, to hear you and bless you and do these different things. But Jesus Christ makes a great statement here of saying that, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're praying in my name, I'll do it for you. We need to remember that. Remember that when you, when you go home this evening. Remember that through the week, throughout the week. Remember that especially when you have trials and tribulations. 
pray in the name of Jesus. And don't just repeat it as something unthoughtful. Everything that we pray should never be a chant. You know, the, the Bible warns us, again, using vain repetitions. Now, just remember that because I know we can all get guilty of this. I try to, to stop myself every time I pray and ask for blessings before I eat my meals because that's one of the times that I choose to sit down and pray. I always try to make it heartfelt. Like I, I'm always honestly praying to God and thinking about what I'm saying. From time to time when I'm real busy at work or something, I'm trying to get some food, I'll say a real quick prayer and sometimes I have to stop myself and just pray again because I'm just saying things just for the sake of saying a prayer before I eat. Um, we ought not to do that and, and, to, and definitely not to get in that habit where it just becomes some vain repetition. We're just saying things, oh God bless this food in my body, thank you, amen. You know, that's, that's not a prayer. You want to, you know, think about the respect we ought to give unto God. First of all, that's, that's who you're speaking to when you're praying. You know, are you going to just treat God as someone you're just going to blow off? And you're like, oh, God, God, yeah, I'm real busy right now. I got all these other things to do right now. I, I can't, I, okay, Edda, thanks. You know, I'm, that's not how we, we ought to be dealing with him. We need to be, you know, even if it's just for a minute, just set this time aside. Be like, okay, I'm going to talk to God now, and I'm going to be serious about it, and then I'm going to go back to doing whatever I was doing. We all should be able to take that moment or whatever it is in our day to be able to 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 speak with God. And we ought to make sure that we're, we're trying to do that for this very reason of this promise that Jesus made unto us. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Let's keep reading here. Verse 15. He says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, again, a real strong statement here. A lot of people have this false belief that once you get saved, you will start living a good life and you will start keeping God's commandments. And that simply is not true. That's not an automatic truthful statement. You can't say just because somebody gets saved because someone has received Christ as their Savior, they put their faith on Jesus. It doesn't mean they're automatically going to start doing good works and keeping God's commandments. Because it's one thing to put your faith on Christ and to believe on Him, and it's another thing to truly love Him. Loving Him is, is keeping His commandments. So think about that too, because it goes the same way. If, if you, in your life, if you're disobeying God's commandments... Can you honestly say that you love God? And think about that. Think about that the next time you, you think about some commandments that you're breaking. Say, hey, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So by not keeping his commandments, we're saying, you know what, God, I don't love you. And, um, and that should be a big deal. That should, that should cut to your heart to think about that and, and to think more seriously about the things that you do that are wrong and the sins that you commit, that what you're saying basically is that you don't love God and you don't respect Him. Um, it's always easy to liken these types of things to children, so I'll, I'll liken it to my children. You know, I have commandments for my children to follow. And if they love me and if they respect me, they're going to listen to me and obey me and do the things that I command them to do um, as my children. When they disobey me, when they disobey my commandments, when they break the rules, and start doing other things. You know what they're saying? They're saying, I don't love you. And, and kids, that's important to remember that too. When you, when you disobey mom and dad, what you're doing is you're, is you're saying that you don't love us. And keep that in mind because you know Jesus Christ said here, if you love me, keep my commandments. And it's something that we need to do to show our love to God. And that's what the Bible says in 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. That is the love of God. That is showing God's love is by obeying Him and by keeping His commandments. People will say, oh man, well, you know, if you're saved just by putting your faith in Christ, then why would you obey any of God's commandments? Because I love Him. Because I love God and I'm very thankful and I appreciate and I respect Him and I thank Him for all that He's done for me in my life, for saving my soul. How's that? Because people like to give you a hard time. Oh, well, why would, why would anyone want to follow His commandments? As if his commandments are grievous, which he says they're not. They're not grievous. It's not like some big deal, some bad thing to, um, to obey God's commandments. 
Jump down to verse 21 here in John 14. He says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So not only is that showing, hey, we love God when we keep his commandments, he says, but God's going to love you. If you're doing his will and you're, and, you're, and you're listening to him and obeying him, not only are you showing your love for him, he loves you. He loves you right back. Um, let's, keep re let's go back up here now to verse 16. I just wanted to, to jump down and point that out real quick while we're on that point. Verse 16 says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. So here we're going to start talking about the Holy Spirit. It's another comforter. That he may abide with you forever. Now, in this life, we have people, we have humans, whether it be a spouse or friends or family, that comfort us, hopefully, in, in times of grief, and times of sadness. You know, someone, someone's there to, to, to help and comfort you. But a person can only spend so much time with you and be with you so much throughout the day. And, and their comfort can only go so far. But what Jesus is explaining to us here, he says, I'm going to give you another comforter and he's going to abide with you. He's going to live with you forever. That is an amazing comfort. That's a great comfort. And if you're saved today, you have that comforter. And remember that and be, be thoughtful on that as well. Because he won't ever leave you or forsake you. No matter what, you have that comforter with you forever. This is a promise of Jesus. He's with you forever. As sure as you can't lose your salvation, you're not going to lose that comforter. Even in, in your lowest, darkest moments, even when you're backslidden, you have that comforter. And, um, and you ought to turn to that comforter, too, to, for, for that comfort. But that's a great promise that he makes to us. He makes to us. Verse 17 says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. The reason why he's saying it shall be in you is because the Holy Spirit wasn't given unto them yet at this point when Jesus was still alive. It wasn't until Jesus rose again and was glorified that he gave the Holy Spirit. We'll, and we'll get into that more because that's actually in the book of John when he breathes on them and says, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And they actually get indwelled with the Holy Spirit, which us as New Testament believers today have all, already have that. We've already experienced it. We don't have to wait for that anymore from God. The moment anybody gets saved, you receive that. But he says that, um, he's basically telling him, look, the Holy Spirit's already been with you, but he's also going to be in you. They knew the Holy Spirit of, of, of you know, maybe feeling him externally, the external presence of the Holy Spirit, but not inside until, until later on. He says, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So Jesus is saying, look, I'm leaving, but there's no reason, of all these things we've read so far, with the prayer and everything else, there's no reason to be discouraged. He's really trying to edify his disciples because he's telling them of this comforter now. He's like, I'm going to be gone. But don't worry, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. You're still going to have that Holy Spirit. And that's something that we have today. Jesus Christ is not physically walking around with us today, but we're not comfortless. We have the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us. Bible says, verse 19, Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will ma manifest myself to him. Verse 22, Judas saith unto him, Not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, so he didn't identify the Comforter as the Holy Ghost yet. He talked about the Spirit of Truth earlier on. He says, when the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, 
whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. This is one of the functions of the Holy Ghost and one of the functions of the, of the, the Comforter is to bring things into remembrance. He says, whatsoever I have told you. So the Holy Ghost is really good at bringing to your remembrance the words of God. God's Word, which is one of the reasons why we focus you know, on our Bible memory. Because the more we know God's Word, the more comfort we'll receive and the more wisdom we'll receive and the more the Holy Ghost will be able to bring to our remembrance. You know, it's impossible for the Holy Ghost to bring something to your remembrance if you've never read it, if you've never seen it, if it's never come in. If, you've ne if you don't know the words, He ain't going to bring that to your remembrance because you never knew them. We need to know His words in order for the Holy Ghost to bring those to your remembrance. And the better you know them, the more you know them, the, the easier it's going to be for the Holy Ghost to bring these things to your remembrance and be like, hey, don't you remember this? You know, the Bible says this and the Bible says that. It helps you when you're, when you're making decisions in life, tough decisions. If you're to think, what's the right thing to do? You know, pray to God that the Holy Spirit will reveal that to you. That's what He's there for is to help you in those types of situations to bring to remembrance the things that are in God's Word. And... Um, that is a true comfort that we can have for, for various reasons when we're going through grief, when we're going through all kinds of different things. Hey, we can take comfort in God's Word and, and, and pray that the Holy Ghost will bring things to our remembrance. I often will pray that when we go out soul winning with someone that, you know, I might not know the right verses, like something that's going to really cut through someone's heart or it's going to really click in their mind that they'll understand. I know what I understand, and I typically use the verses that I understand very well. That's why John 5, 24, almost nobody I speak to about the gospel walks away from me without hearing that verse because to me, it's extremely clear and it makes perfect sense to me and explains salvation and how you can't lose it. It's eternal. It's forever. Um, that is some, a verse that makes sense to me, but everybody's a little bit different. Everybody's got verses and parts of the Bible that make more sense to them. Or maybe someone's got something going on in their life and you hit a verse that just is like really directly applies to wherever they're at at that moment. So I'll pray that God will bring to, to my remembrance verses that a person's going to need to hear. You know, I'll pray to God, just ask Him, God, you know, use the Holy Spirit to bring out a verse that this person, a particular person, is going to need to hear, whoever you're leading me to. And um, if you don't do that, I would, I would recommend incorporating that because there's so many times I know I've talked to people and like, man, this is really weird. We were just talking about so and so, and sometimes it's with verses that I don't normally turn to. You have a conversation with something, and then something pops in your head and say, oh yeah, you know, this this is kind of relevant to what we're talking about. But again, in order to do that, you have to have read and at least know the Bible a little bit to be able to to have that brought to your remembrance. You have to know that that you you have read it before. But um, let's, let's finish up here. The Bible says, um, verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So he's repeating himself from the very first verse, let not your heart be troubled. All the way down here in verse 27, he's saying, I'm giving you peace. I'm leaving you with peace. You're going to be comforted. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be afraid. You know, you're going to go through some hard times now because I'm going to be gone. You might be, you know, concerned, worried. What's going to happen? Don't be afraid. Verse 28, you have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice. So he's trying to explain to him too, it's not a time for sorrow that he's leaving. He says, you should rejoice because, and this is why, because I said I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And rejoice that I'm going unto my Father. And honestly, when you know someone who's saved, I know it's sorrowful and very grievous when they pass away, but it really isn't a time that, that we should be super grieved about if we know the person was saved. We should be happy for them that they went on to be with the Lord. 
That is, that is a very good comfort that we can have for those that are saved. And it can ease our grief. Now, usually we're sad because we're thinking of ourselves in the sense that we aren't going to see this person anymore. We love that person. But see, that's not even necessarily true because we are going to see that person again. We will see them one day in heaven. It's just going to be for a, a period of time that we won't see them. We will be reunited. We will be rejoined with that person. So Jesus is really trying to explain, really exhort them, really comfort them and show them, look, be happy for me. I'm going unto my Father. Verse 29, And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass ye might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me but that the world may know that I love the Father and as the Father gave me commandment even so I do. Arise, let us go ahead. So these last few verses, I'll expound them real quickly and we're done. Um, as he's finishing up his comforting statements, he's saying, you know, I told you these things before they're even happening to help you believe, which is all the prophets of God, which is why they're included in God's word. God's prophets speak when they speak the truth, it's when it, you know it's. If, that's how you know one of God's prophets is when they speak the truth, not like these false prophets like Joseph Smith when they make all these claims and predictions and they never come to pass because they're not speaking God's word. They didn't get any revelations from God. They got revelations from Satan. But when God's prophets speak, everything comes to pass. When they're speaking God's word, because God's word cannot fail, and Jesus Christ's words cannot fail. And oftentimes, and, and it, this, is, this is one of the great comforts we have even through the tribulation, it's not going to catch us by surprise. It's already been told to us. And that's what Jesus is trying to warn his disciples about and saying, look, I'm going to go. I'm going to be gone. I'm going to be crucified and, and I'm going to leave. I'm going to be dead. And, but don't worry, you know, I'm going to go to my father and, and you know, I'm going to leave you a comforter and all this other stuff. But he's saying... You know, I have to leave. But don't be afraid. And I'm telling you this now before I even go. So it's not a complete shock to you. When it does happen, you're more prepared. You could be ready to, to handle that. And um, he explains here that the prince of this world is going to come, which is why, that's why he's leaving. And Satan has no, nothing to do with him. Verse 31, but that the world may know that I love the Father. So he's saying for two reasons. You know, so the world knows that I do love the Father. He's going to do this. And as the Father gave me commandment, it was a commandment for Jesus to do this. Even so I do arise, let us go hence. So this is all taking place during their last supper. Right? That this is in, in sequence. I know we go weeks without reading these chapters, but um, all of this conversation and stuff has happened. Judas Iscariot was given the sop. He left, he departed, and they're still in that chamber and they're, and they're, they're eating and, and, and fellowshipping and Jesus is, is teaching them and talking to them. And now they're about to leave. So he's like, okay, let's get up and go. And that's where this chapter ends. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. God, I pray that you would please just um, help us to be mindful of the comforter, dear Lord. We thank you for that comfort. I know that, that the Holy Spirit has been a real blessing in my life. God, and, it's, and it strengthens us to know that you won't just leave us and, and you'll never leave us or forsake us, dear God. You've given us the Holy Spirit. We've, we're sealed with your spirit of promise, dear God. Um, we marvel at, at your amazing words and, and the truth of, of Jesus Christ being the way, the truth, and the life, dear Lord. Um, we may not always fully comprehend uh, the, the, some of these truths in the Bible, but um, we believe them, God, because they're here and, and we trust that um, you'll just help us to understand that more and more as we get older and as we continue to read your word. God, I pray that you please just open up our minds and help us to learn more about you. And Lord, help us not to be negligent in our prayer life, but to, to fully trust in your promises that, that you will do the things that we ask in Jesus' name. And it's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray tonight. Amen.